No, he isn't. Ah, oh, you're supposed to end the video with the conclusion. All right, let's start over. A lot of people seem to think that Tyrion Lannister, you know, the funny short dude, yeah, him, they seem to think that he's a Targaryen. The interesting thing is that he isn't, and yet they still think this. Well, I've got some free time, so let's hear them out. We begin with a story of two men, Aerys Targaryen and Tywin Lannister. Friends since childhood, the two bonded when Tywin was a page at King's Landing, and the connection was galvanised when Tywin knighted Aerys during the War of the Nine Penny Kings. We're not entirely sure why the two boys initially became friends, but there are hints in the text that they developed a common interest in playing Raid Shadow Legends. And it should come as no surprise, honestly, given that Raid Shadow Legends has millions of players and dozens of bosses, yes, this is actually happening. Neither of them were knights yet, so the banner a lord faction in the game would be a great way for them and you to become an epic warrior champion with armor, weapons and character designs modeled on knights of medieval Europe. There's an intriguing storyline regarding the fate of Good King Tabor which I'm sure would appeal to Aerys and Tywin. I don't know about them but my favorite banner lord champion would have to be Lord Champfort because I've always enjoyed tank rolls and come on just look at all that HP and he looks exactly like a medieval knight. I was actually genuinely surprised by how in-depth the combat bat and level up mechanics of this game are, and I really do love the designs of all these end of level bosses. My favourite part of the game has to be sacrificing lesser champions to power up my main ones. <laughs> Burn for your saviours! The lizard part of my brain really enjoys all the bright colours on the reward screen. Watching all the numbers go up is a great exercise of Skinner Box design. This month, Raid is adding 11 new champions and 200 missions. 200? Are you serious? So what are you waiting for? Use my associated link below so you can start liberating Teleria with your Whomping Champions today. Find me if you can, I'm Big Glimbo in game. So yeah, just click the funny link in the description below and I'll see you in game. Huh, weird. That's never happened before. Anyway, today we'll be tackling the idea that Tyrion is Aerys' son by Joanna Lannister. But note that there is another theory that gives the half-man Targaryen parentage, but I'm way too sober to get into time-travelling fetuses right at this moment. Oh, also, we're talking about the books in this video mainly, because it's more fun that way. Look at the fun we're having. So the year 262 rolls around, and Aerys' dad drops dead. He was ill, and he died. He died of illness. So the new king puts his boy Tywin in charge of the kingdom, decades of prosperity, descent into madness, whatever, you know the drill. What we care about is that the following year, hand mode Tywin married his hot cousin Joanna. I won't live in a town that robs men of the right to marry their cousins. And it wasn't just Tywin who thought his cousin was hot. Eris, young rapscallion he was, reportedly made remarks about Joanna and the sex he would like to have with her. He also ragged on Alysanne's legacy by lamenting the outlawing of the first night. Asshole. I will be reinstituting Prima Nocta. Decades later, Barristan recalls with PTSD tinged nostalgia that Eris took liberties during the bedding. Joanna was dismissed from the Queen's service so she could live in Castle Rock, and it looks like Tywin continued serving Eris in the capital, and things went pretty well thereafter. Cersei and Jaime were born three years later, Titos died the following year, so Tywin became Warden of the West and all that, but when he returned from Castle Rock, Eris vetoed a lot of Tywin's actions and started ruling? Like he was the king or something? Tensions between the two came to a head at this big honkin' tourney to celebrate 10 years of Aerys ruling, when the king asked rather forwardly how Joanna's tits were holding up, and then refused to accept Tywin's resignation the next day. Sounds like a guy who just didn't care what people thought, and he's just living his truth. Don't listen to the haters, Aerys. Burn them all. Oh right, so the next year, Joanna gave birth to Tyrion, our favourite deformed dwarf, and also died out of embarrassment because he was so ugly. That was in the year 273, and then of course, course, in the year 1998, The Undertaker threw mankind off hell in a cell and plummeted 16 feet through an announcer's table. Okay, so that's like the logistics of the scenario around Tyrion's birth. Eris clearly had a thing for Joanna, or at least he really liked joking about having a thing for her, and he like did something during her wedding and was in the same vicinity as her in the year prior to Tyrion's birth. So the mechanics of Eris impregnating Joanna are physically plausible, if not unsubstantiated by the text. More on that later. Let's push forward and dig into why people think that Tyrion is not a Lannister. First, I'll present a bunch of evidence that people cite, and then after that, I'm going to tell you what I think of it all. Here we go. Evidence the first. Phenotype. 
Tyrion looks weird. In Ned's story, Gurm made hair colour a focal point of determining parentage, so it makes sense that people would gravitate to examining Tyrion's unusual case. Lannisters, rather famously, are blonde, green-eyed, and just good to look at in general. Tywin, Jaime, Cersei, Joffrey, Marcella, Tommen, kinda, and Lancel each exhibit all of these features. And additionally, Joanna was supposedly really hot, Kevin isn't too sexy but he has the hair and the eyes, Tyrek's eyes are never mentioned but he has the hair and he's handsome, Davin has yellow hair but Hazel eyes, and we also know about the golden hair of Timmond, Jason, Tybalt, and Gerald. It seems that maintaining these features in the main line is important, which explains why Tywin would marry his cousin when surely there was a more useful political marriage available for him, and it also strongly indicates that the typical Lannister genotype is relatively weak, as it is constantly dominated by, for example, Baratheon and Frey features. And just to clear it up, no, of course, real world genetics are not this simple, but in Gurm's world they very much seem to be. So if Tyrion is from the main line and both of his parents are golden haired Lannisters, why is it that Tyrion has what is described as pale blonde hair and a black eye? Some people think that while Tyrion's eye appears black, it's actually a very deep purple, and that his white blonde hair is actually silver or platinum blonde. Obviously both of these are typical Valyrian features, which are inexplicable with the given story of Tyrion's Lannister roots, but make complete sense with an heiress-based parentage. Also, Tyrion's name shares five of its six letters with a certain shade of purple heavily associated with royalty, which might be a subtle hint that Tyrion in fact comes from the family of purple-eyed royals. Evidence the Second Dragons and Dreams Tyrion loves dragons. As a kid, he asked his uncle for one. As an adult, he's one of the most informed people in Westeros, if not the whole world, on the topic of dragons. John Connington asks him to write everything he knows about dragons, and he labours away at it every day for... we don't know how long, but the important thing is that he knows enough that Connington thinks Aegon will gain something from Tyrion's dragon lore that he wouldn't already have from decades worth of Illyrio's efforts and resources. Also, when I think about extinct semi-legendary creatures from our own world and how much I could write about them, I would definitely be done before the second day. For someone who isn't technically a scholar, Tyrion knows an insane amount about dragons, being able to rattle off ancient dragon lore literature from the top of his head, having read every book he can on the subject, and speculating on the locations of the books he hasn't read. So why? Why is he so obsessed with dragons? None of the other characters we're intimate with consider dragons anywhere near this deeply, aside from Daenerys and Aemon, who are of course both Targaryens. Those with the blood of the dragon sometimes have what are called dragon dreams, so perhaps Tyrion's overt and also subconscious fascination with dragons could be explained by his secret Targaryen parentage. Evidence the Third <laughs> Tywin. Tywin hated Tyrion. Dadoi. This hardly requires any textual evidence given that this relationship is one of the core components of both characters. The theory goes that Tywin's extreme hate for Tyrion is best explained by them not actually being father and son. Some versions of the theory have Tywin aware that Tyrion is not his son and merely his first cousin once removed, while others place him as an unknowing cuck. As you could probably guess, this leads to a slew of incompatible iterations of the theory. Some say that Tywin couldn't bring himself to kill Tyrion even though he knew he wasn't his out of his love for Joanna, while others say that if he could have proven it, Tywin would have left Tyrion for dead at the drop of a widow. There's too many differing takes to cover here, and also it doesn't matter too much, so don't worry. What most versions do regard as quite important is the extreme severity of Tywin's hatred for Tyrion. Could a father really hate his trueborn son this much? To actively seek his death with some frequency? Even given the societal attitude towards dwarves and Joanna's death, surely Tywin's hatred for his own son is best explained by him not actually being his son. So says the theory. Of course, Tywin's dying words, said to Tyrion, are You're no son of mine which could be a grand admission of this secret truth at the apex of their conflict. Other quotes like All dwarves are bastards in their father's eyes. And You are an ill-made, spiteful little creature. And I cannot prove that you are not mine. Are also considered by some as strong textual evidence for a Targi Tyrion. Evidence the fourth. Joanna. 
Eris desired Joanna. That much is more or less certain. Making a remark about the right to the first night, taking liberties during the bedding ceremony, asking about her boobs a decade later, it's hard to dispute that the guy had a thing for her. Apparently she was like, really hot, so this scans. Furthermore, Maester Yandel writes that Rayella didn't approve of Eris turning her ladies into whores, before making a note about Joanna being dismissed from Rayella's service. This is the strongest piece of evidence to suggest that Eris and Joanna actually actually canoodled. Nine years later, a drunk heiress made that joke at that tourney, and the next year that dwarf was born. So there's this idea that something happened between them at this tourney, consent notwithstanding. Tywin's attempted resignation at this point further indicates that something salacious happened between the two. This, and all the previously stated evidence, is why Tyrion Lannister is indeed Tyrion Hill, a bastard of Targaryen blood. Or at least it's a lot of the commonly cited evidence for the theory. Not all of it, obviously, because this one gets around a lot, and there's no single monolithic iteration of it to point at. You'll notice that I haven't presented any parallels that people sometimes talk about in support of Tyrion Targaryen, like how the mothers of Daenerys, Tyrion, and probably Jon Snow all died giving birth to them, and how that means that they're all Targaryens. I've done this because that kind of stuff, along with Tyrion picking up the White Dragon Syvas piece, does not constitute solid evidence. It's extremely circumstantial and open to interpretation, and the connection to this theory is tangential at best, flimsy on average, and laughable at worst. It supports the theory, but only if you're already committed to it. Tyrion, Jon, and Daenerys sharing that fact about their births could definitely connect them to one another in some way, but in what world does it indicate that they're related? That's why I didn't include that stuff in here. It requires too large a leap in logic. So now that I've made the case for Tyrion Targaryen, let's go through why all the presented evidence is actually garbage. Debunkering the First Phenotype while it's true that there are a few examples in A Song of Ice and Fire of purple becoming black, only two of them are in reference to eye colour. The first is Ariana's thoughts of Gerald Dane, the Dark Star. And the second is Tyrion's thoughts of Aegon. Oh, and Dunk's thoughts of Egg in the Swan Sword. All of these people actually do have canonically purple eyes, a fact which is mentioned in each of the passages at hand. Whereas Tyrion has a black eye that is never compared to or thought of as a shade of purple in the text ever. It is... It, it, it's black. Moving on to the hair. Some words which are used to describe Valyrian or Valyrian-ish hair are also used to describe Tyrion's hair. But what the Tyrion Targaryen theory fails to address is the rest of his hair. Like, why does he also have black hair? Is he also a secret Baratheon? And why isn't his hair all the same colour like everyone else's is? Why was Tyrion born with a shitty e-girl shriek? And that same term that connects Tyrion's hair to Valyrian hair, white blonde, is also used to describe Tommen. So what's up with that. And as for the colour that Tyrion shares his name with, not only is it a completely different shade of purple than the ones typically associated with Targaryen eyes, it's also kind of weird that George would leave this in as a clue when drafting the character in 1993, leaving absolutely no other indication in the first book that it's a reference to his true heritage. Also, while we're drawing evidence from words that are a letter away from the character's name, Tyrion with two eyes is a real-world name in the Welsh language. A couple of films, not after their hat. One of the cities of the Noldor in Tolkien's Heaven analogue, and of course, the High Lord of the Argent Crusade. So as far as evidence goes, concerning Tyrion's features, this theory not only makes a logical leap of great magnitude, it also fails to explain the phenomenon at hand comprehensively, and it neglects other examples of the same anomaly. But then the question remains, why does Tyrion look like that? Well, let's get through the rest of the evidence before posing other explanations. Debunkering the Second Dragons and Dreams Okay, this is silly. Firstly, let's get the biggest thing out of the way. Tyrion does not have dragon dreams. Tyrion had dreams about dragons. These are very different things. Dragon dreams are necessarily prophetic, and don't even have to be about dragons. Tiora Toland and Shireen Baratheon dream about dragons, so are they Targaryens? I mean, Shireen's great-grandmother was, but if that was enough, then why do we never hear about Gendry's dreams? Or Elia, Oberyn, and Durans, and their children? That was 
Dreams about dragons are not dragon dreams in this sense, and having them does not make you a Targaryen. When Aemon speaks of dragon dreams, he equates them to prophecy. When Prince Daeron tells Dunk his dream in the Hedge Knight, it's prophetic. Daenys the Dreamer had prophetic dreams. Aemon and Egg had prophetic dreams. Daemon Blackfire had prophetic dreams. Daenerys has prophetic dreams. Tyrion does not have prophetic dreams. There's this one dream he has in Dance where he's fighting in Westeros with Barristan and Bittersteel and he kills Jamie and Tywin and he has two heads and it's weird and some people call this prophetic and like no in what way if it's to be taken as anything concrete it's weirdly reminiscent of Melis and the war of the nine penny kings which is a historical event and therefore not prophetic before anything like this actually occurs in the future we can't just go around calling it prophetic now you could say that Barristan represents Daenerys and Bittersteel represents Aegon and Tyrion is the monstrosity between them and he has a green eye and a black eye for the black and the greens. But describing strict meaning to symbolism like this is flimsy and inadvisable for a series written by a guy who is intentionally obtuse with prophecy and symbolism. And even if this dream was prophetic, so what? Jojen and Bran have prophetic dreams and they're not Targaryens. The ghosts of High Heart and Patchface are spitting prophecies left and right and I don't see anyone calling them Targaryens. Uh, there, there probably are people who do that. As for the fascination with dragons, yeah? The guy likes dragons. Big whoop. Plenty of people like dragons. He's a nerd who won't stop reading. I do love the idea that Tyrion's dragon lore will end up affecting the story in a big way, considering that Jon Connington still has all the stuff he wrote down before Jorah captured him, but liking dragons means he's a Targaryen? Come on. The logic here is that because Tyrion is obsessed with dragons and only Targaryens ride dragons, Tyrion must therefore be a Targaryen. Using the same logic, we can deduce that because Brienne is obsessed with Renly and only men ride Renly, Brienne must therefore be a man. It's fucking stupid. Debunkering the third. Tywin. The idea that Tywin's intense hatred for Tyrion can only be explained by him not actually being his father is an attempt to find a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Family dynamics like this and worse, exist in the real world. There's nothing about this relationship that demands further explanation. Everything about Tyrion is perfectly designed to make Tywin hate him. He's a deformed dwarf who Tywin perceives as a mockery of his legacy who killed the love of his life. He reflects Tywin's worst values of debauchery and extreme ego, and the man hates seeing himself being represented like this. I see no need to look for further explanation. Tywin is an immense asshole, and it's plain to see that he's a horrible father to all of his children. Furthermore, as Gildane notes, if Eris really did have a pre-existing affair with Joanna, there's no way Tywin would have married her. At least, that's what Pycelle told him, and sure, Pycelle is brown-nosing, but this does fall in line with the Tywin we know. And if we're taking You're no son of mine at face value, that Tywin is for some reason clairvoyantly declaring the absolute truth, then surely we must also take You're a Lannister. You're my son. At face value. And what about Jenna, Tywin's sister, telling Jamie that Tyrion is Tywin's son and not Jamie? This is probably the worst facet of the theory, honestly, proving Tywin right. Tyrion is of Tywin's body and they both have to deal with that. It's just so lame and easy and lackluster if it turns out that none of the conflict is actually based in reality. And most importantly, it's not very germ. What does Tyrion's story gain from Tywin not being his father? What does the overall story gain from Tyrion being a Targaryen bastard. And I don't want to hear, oh it's so cool because Jaime kills Tyrion's father and Tyrion kills Jaime's father. That isn't anything. Nobody asked for that. Tyrion killed his own father because he was going to kill him, maybe. And he has to deal with that. Debunkering the Fourth. Joanna. First of all, I want to make clear that all of the supporting evidence for any relationship between Eris and Joanna comes from either Barristan Selmy or Maester Yandel. Barristan is a celibate, honor-obsessed knight who is recalling events from like 40 years ago, and he's talking to a teenaged girl about how her father was a hunk of shit. Of course he's going to be uncomfortable and reserved. For all we know, when he mentions the liberties Eris took during Joanna's bedding, he could just mean that he touched her bum or flashed her or something. Similarly, Yandel 
Randall is also a sexless nerd who doesn't know anything about anything, relaying second-hand accounts, at, at best, best, about an event that happened a decade before he was born concerning people he has never met. But we should keep in mind that the world of Ice and Fire is, in-universe, edited with politics in mind, which is why there's so little on Ned Stark and Stannis Baratheon, for example. So maybe Yandel is downplaying the magnitude of the relationship between Joanna and Eris. But then again, if the rumour of their affair had any basis, then why do we never hear of it across any of the books? The only person to ever mention anything between the two of them is Barristan. Tywin has plenty of enemies who would be keen to smear his reputation, so it's strange that this is never brought up by any of them. Gildane writes that Eris took unwanted liberties with Joanna's person, and it's like, if Yandel is trying to stay on the ruling house's good side, why would he include this if it actually meant anything? But then again, why would this be included in the book if it didn't mean anything? But then again, again, that book is completely full of so many pointless details that there's no way they're all going to be relevant in the end. I think the whole rumour of their relationship was included just to deepen the complexity of this period of Westerosi history, and to sow the seeds of distrust between Tywin and Aerys, not to indicate that Tyrion is in fact a dragon boy. Seems to me that Aerys was infatuated with Joanna, and upon repeated advances, the Queen saw fit to send her friend back home to keep her safe from the King. Joanna hardly ever visited the capital after this, even though it's where her husband lived and served for most of 18 years, which could indicate that she was avoiding Aerys at all costs. The next interaction we hear of between them leaves her humiliated, so that adds up. Given the story that we've been told, I don't see how Aerys could have impregnated Joanna at the anniversary tourney. All Tywin did afterwards was attempt to resign, and then did nothing when Aerys said no. This is Tywin we're talking about, the man whose pride is more important to him than anything else. Would he really just roll over after Aerys had done something like that? Okay. There we go. There's a bunch of reasons why all the common evidence for Tyrion Targaryen is kinda just not great. But without that theory, how do we explain all the weird stuff about Tyrion? Namely, his appearance. Explaining the anomaly. If you're looking for a scientific answer to why Tyrion looks the way he does, chimerism is a possible explanation. Simply put, a genetic chimera is a single organism that has more than one genotype. In animals, this is caused by the merging of two fertilised eggs. Two fertilised eggs is also how non-identical twins come about, and House Lannister has a bit of a twin thing going on, with Cersei and Jaime, Martin and Willem, Tywald and Tyon, and Jason and Tyland. So perhaps Tyrion was initially conceived as a pair of twins whose zygotes merged in just if you think this is a bit much for a fantasy series, consider that Gurm has written so many stories that have genetics as a central or near central idea, and that Maelie's the Monstrous, who Tyrion is paralleled with at least once, also has features that can be explained with chimerism. In some rare occurrences, non-identical twins can have separate fathers, a phenomenon called <gasps> heteropaternal superfecundation. So some people roll with this and say that Tyrion is a genetic chimera with both Tywin and Aerys as his fathers. This is kinda mental logistically, and I've already kinda discounted the idea that Aerys impregnated Joanna, but part of me is pretty okay with this idea, mainly because it addresses the duality of Tyrion's entire person. His appearance, his loyalties, his character. A green-eyed blonde man with a black eye and black hair. A Lannister with sympathies for Starks and Targaryens. A kind man who kills people. A genius who makes horribly stupid decisions. That said though, it's kinda outlandish and still doesn't explain where the black hair and eye came from. But does that even really warrant an explanation? When we theorise on something like the identity of Jon Snow's mother, that's an issue which is explicitly wondered about in the story by several characters. But Tyrion's rotten and deformed appearance is never speculated upon in-universe. I really like the explanation that Aerys himself apparently gave. The gods cannot abide such arrogance. They have plucked a fair flower from Tywin's hand and given him a monster in her place to teach him some humility at last. By the way, if he truly did have a relationship with Joanna, would Eris have been that mocking about her death? The only explanations given in the story for Tyrion's deformities are metaphorical, and I think that's how we should view it too. He appears twisted and malformed because he is twisted and malformed, not because he's a secret Targaryen bastard. 
Conclusion. And now I hope to never hear about this theory ever again. Thank you very much. It's a story a lot of people seem to like because it makes Tywin a massive cuck, which I can get behind, but it damages the existing story more than it enriches it. Keep in mind that it is still possible or even likely that Tyrion will ride a dragon. His extensive and unparalleled knowledge of them is a Chekhov's gun of sorts, and I'll eat pant if it doesn't show up again before stories end. And if you were really hoping that Tywin turns out to be a massive cuck, then you could instead roll with the Twin Targs theory, which has basically the same logistical backing as this one, with similar levels of circumstantial evidence, but is generally a lot less of a narrative disaster. Maybe we'll talk about that one some other time. Wink wink. Lastly, it's worth noting that the show ended without ever making explicit reference to the idea that Tyrion is in fact a Targaryen. I'm not one to take this as conclusive proof to the contrary though, because A, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. What? Two, far be it from me to hope that the books end the same as the show, and ampersand, there are already so many other ways to diffuse this theory. I do hope that I haven't constructed a straw man though. If there's more evidence that you think I should address, let me know and maybe I'll do a follow up live stream to this video. Give me excuses to stream, damn it. Thanks for watching and enduring the wait between videos. Season 6 next for real this time. Friggin subscribe and all that shit, and check out me Patreon to join the extremely handsome likes of Agly here. Org, Blue Mustard, Glanus, Hoveram, Ingvold, Mormoths, QC Whitebird, Samsum, Simcoe, Stay78, Waffle, and Ondi. Thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring the video, and to the total bro who sent them my way. It means a lot. Of course we all know the theory is moot because he's actually a Dane.